Morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9, and can be found in 984 of the Bible. After six, de- after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and brother J- James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like, a, like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped up them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw only Jesus. As they came down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you've seen, or the Son of Man will have raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're just going to pray for Charles before he speaks to us. It is space. Father, we thank you for Charles. Thank you for the words that you've given him. Thank you for his preparation. And I pray for your anointing on him now as he speaks to us. And I pray that our hearts and minds will be open to hear from you this morning. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. You know, the last people to know what is going on in people's lives are the people who are actually in the same church as yourselves. So I've decided to keep on um, spreading more of the news. It has been an extremely tough week for me. I, uh, my work takes me to different parts of the world. Last week, I was in Nigeria uh, on Wednesday last week, invited by an insurance company to teach on transformational leadership for two days. The British Airways flight that we took to Lagos, Nigeria, could not land in Lagos because it's uh, the Hamatan season, which means visibility is very, very poor and very low. So the pilot circled a little bit and could not land the plane. And he said, we've got an option either to go to Ghana, another country, or go to Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And he tried again for 30 minutes, but could not land the plane. So I think Ghana refused to accept them fortuitously. Because Ghana already had some backload from previous flights. And it's a small country. So we went to Abuja. And I'm thinking, I've been praying furiously in the plane. I'm meant to be speaking the following day. Lord, what's going on? Anyhow, missed that whole day so couldn't speak that day, got to Abuja. The Emirates flight already landed with over 300 people because they couldn't land in Lagos either. Virgin landed in the afternoon, clear, clearer visibility. And I'm wondering, what am I going to do here? Over 600 people at the airport. They said, right, anyone who can take care of themselves will give you 200 pounds for your hotel and transportation and your meals. For the others, we will find accommodation or hotels for you. Over 100 people had to sleep at top hotel lobbies with your children. 
there was no space, it was very late in the night. So we made our way, fortunately I knew my way around, and survived the night. Next day we waited and waited to hear news from BA. Finally contacted us to come to the airport at 2.30, because BA, they couldn't fly either. They, had to, they were stuck there as well. So we went to Lagos the following day, stayed, spent four hours at the airport, worn out completely, nowhere to sit, packed, and got to Abu, uh, Lagos the following day, got to the hotel about 9 p.m. in the night, rested, and then went to speak the following day. Came out, four days of absolutely stress. Two days in between, we had a good time. I delivered my message. Came back to London. What I didn't mention is that the Lord instructed me since October of last year to begin a ministry, not to church or anything like that. And I wrestled with it for a while, because the next thing he said to me, and I want you to do it for free. <laughs> I thought, for free? Yeah, but I knew I heard it. So I said, yes, Lord. But I dilly-dallied for since October. I said, okay. And then the pressure was very strong in December. I said, Lord, I promise you I would do it. So I launched it yesterday in London. I began with a small seed of 20 people. We had barristers, financial advisors, all manner of people showed up. I announced it on Facebook, and people just registered. Hired a hotel place, provided refreshments, everything, free, no charge, and systematically went through scripture. God is asking me to take his name back out into the marketplace, to business people, to professionals, this is the area where I apply my trade, to bring his glory back to the marketplace, to help them to understand that God is in the business of helping you build your empires with his word. There is this misconception that God is not interested in your wealth or success. I have no idea where people get that from. God can take anybody who will believe him and trust him to the highest possible level. I'm on a mission to do that. Resounding success. I talked for four and a half hours yesterday. We had a break, refreshment in between. One and a half hours later, they still have refused to leave. Still hanging around, still hanging around, video recording. Some, someday maybe I may show clips of what people had to say. So to prepare for this message was tough because I didn't have a lot of time. So I asked the Lord, for help. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the transfiguration. But let's begin initially with John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. The Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and that the Word was with God, and that the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shined brightly in the darkness. And the darkness could not comprehend or overcome it. There was a man named John. He was sent by the Lord to bear witness of this light. He himself was not the light. He was sent to bear witness of the light. That through him men may believe that this is the true light that cometh into the world, that lighteth every man coming into the world. He came to his own, or came to the world that he made, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many 
has received him. He gave them power to be sons and daughters of God. Children born not of human flesh or of blood or of the will of man, but children born of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The only begotten of the Father, we beheld his glory. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is Jesus Christ. That is who we are talking a little bit about today from another perspective or from another dimension. So the little note that I prepared here is the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. A face shining like the sun, clothes of dazzling white, a voice from a cloud, something powerful is occurring on that mountain top. But it is difficult for the disciples to comprehend. They along with others have known Jesus as a teacher, a healer, even a prophet along the lines of Elijah or Jeremiah. To be sure, each of these is a role that Jesus fills beautifully, but none alone captures his full identity. Peter gets it right in his confession that Jesus is the Messiah, if you remember. The son of the living God. But his human limitation prevents his understanding of what that confession he made truly meant. You see, in Matthew 16, 28, before we get to 17, Jesus made the startling statement that there were some standing there with him who would not taste death before they saw him coming in his kingdom. Now, six days after the incident at Caesarea in Philippi, Jesus took his three key disciples, Peter, James, and John. He took them up a high mountain to reveal his glory to them. Because you could be with somebody and not truly know who they are. So they've been hanging out with Jesus, but they have never really seen the real Jesus. This was a privilege for a privileged few to really see and encounter the creator of the world. We remember that Moses went up Mount Sinai into a cloud of fire to receive the Ten Commandments from God, if you remember that. But the elders also in Exodus 24 also went up the mountain where they ate and they drank in the presence of God. So going up the mountain is not a new thing. A lot of massive encounters have happened at mountaintops. You see, when Elijah ran from his ministry in fear of Jezebel, <clears throat> he fled to Mount Horeb. And there the Lord spoke to him with a gentle whisper, if you remember that massive encounter, which you find in 1 Kings 19. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him up this mountain not only to reveal his glory to them, but also for them to see Moses and Elijah as well. <clears throat> These icons of faith, Moses and Elijah, Moses the lawgiver and Elijah the prophet, they were not dead. They were alive and well. And there they could see them having a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a glorious sight it must have been. 
You see, a chameleon is known for its ability to change color, so it can hide itself in its environment so that it is less susceptible to attack. However, when a human being is said to show their true colors, we usually say that with a negative connotation. There, he's shown his true colors, or she has shown her true colors. Usually we mean that in a bad sense. However, when Jesus became as white as lightning, on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, we might say that he was showing his true colors, but in a good sense this time. His holiness and divinity beamed from within him. He didn't conceal his glory. He let it shine. It was a beautiful sight for Peter, James, and John to behold, one they would never forget. You see, Scripture tells us that God the Father lives in unapproachable light. He is too bright for any human eyes to be able to behold him. No human being has ever seen God or can ever see God. You can't see God and survive the experience or live. So he sent his son, who is an expression of God, so that we can relate. Because he dwells in unapproachable light. Just try and look up at the psalm in its full glory, if you can. And usually you'll have to put on glasses or you have to squint. Let alone when you have to behold God in his full essence. And this is what was truly happening here. God, Jesus, wanted to show these key players who he truly is, his true essence. And they were privileged to behold this glory. In some ways, this was indescribable. Matthew says that Jesus' clothes shone as bright as light and his face shone like the sun. Luke's narrative described his clothes like lightning. Mark mentions that they were brighter than anyone could bleach them. Different ways of describing what was really seemingly indescribable. The glory of God shining through the clothing of a man. Jesus had done Glorious things like calming the sea, walking on water, healing the lame people and lepers, even raising the dead. But this was another sense, a completely different ball game, and a completely different experience altogether for these disciples. He wasn't just showing his divinity through his actions. He was showing them his real being, his real essence. He was in his very essence, the glorious God in the flesh. And the disciples got to see it with their very eyes. Now, when you think of a butterfly coming out of a cocoon, for the very first time, you begin to have an idea of what we call metamorphosis transformation from a, you know, bought from a, out of the cocoon. This is what was happening here because when you see this cocoon or this butterfly breaking forth before it's able to fly in its glorious colors, Peter, James, and John were witnesses to a beautiful view of Jesus. As they describe it to us, the Holy Spirit wants us to envision it with our eyes of faith as well, as if we were standing there with Peter, James, and John, staring at Jesus too. But the conversation that Jesus was having with Moses and Elijah was not what the disciples wanted to hear. 
They were talking about Jesus' exodus, how Jesus was going to leave the earth, and how he was going to finish out his ministry. You see, when the Israelites left slavery of Egypt, it had to happen at the death of their firstborn children of Egypt, of the firstborn children of Egypt, and the firstborn of the lambs. Remember the plagues. This exodus, however, in order to free us, you and I, from sin and death, it would have to happen at the death of Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah understood this had to happen. They were able to discuss this with Jesus, and they tried not to talk him out of it. They would be able to speak on the same level as Jesus and encourage him on the way to heaven. This is what they had prophesied about in the old writings. They knew what had to be done. Jesus will have to suffer and die on the cross for our sins. This glorious God will have to reveal his glory once again and go down from the mountain to go to the valley of the shadow of death. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Moses and Elijah? Why not Father Abraham? Who is the father of faith? Why not him? Why Moses? Why Elijah? Why not Jacob? When Jacob was transformed, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. He, become the, he became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Mighty man, why not him? Why not the psalmist? The incomparable and mighty King David. Why not him? Why not the brainiac? The one that blows you away with his mental acuity, with his mental power. The mighty apostle Paul. Why not him? Why Moses? And Elijah. Well, remarkably, these two Old Testament persons appeared and spoke with a transfigured Jesus. You see, Moses had lived on the earth for some 1,400 years prior, and Elijah 900 years prior. Yet, they were alive. Here they were talking with Jesus in some sort of resurrected, glorified state. So, okay, it is fair to think that these two particular persons from the Old Testament appeared because they represented the law, Moses, or represented the prophets, Elijah. These were the sum of Old Testament revelations. They came to meet with Jesus at this Mount of Transfiguration. We can also say that Moses represents those who die and go to glory. And Elijah, we may say, represents those who are caught up to heaven. If you remember, he went in a chariot to heaven without dying. So this could be as in the rapture, where we will all be lifted up, which you'll find in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Who knows? However, from this we see saints who have long departed still live. They live in their personality because they could identify this was Moses and Elijah. They can still be known by their names and enjoy near access to Christ talking with him. Luke 9.31 tells us the theme of their conversation. What were they talking about? They spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They spoke of the upcoming work of the cross, and presumably of the resurrection that will follow. They appeared unto them 
the disciples, but they talked with Jesus Christ. The object of the two holy ones who showed up was not to converse with the disciples or apostles, but to talk with their master. Although saints are seen of men, their fellowship is usually with Jesus Christ, according to Charles Spurgeon. Mark 9, 6 and Luke 9, 33 point out that Peter didn't know what he was saying when he said this. You know, good old Peter, we all know when we read scripture about amazing Peter. Peter helps us to recognize that no matter how ordinary we are, we are still accepted and we have hope. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Mark 9, 6 and Luke 9, 33 point out that Peter didn't know what he was saying when he said those words. Though said without careful thought, the effect of his words put Jesus on an equal footing or equal level with Moses and Elijah building equal shrines for each of them. Peter suggested the retention of the three in association, Moses, the lawgiver, Elijah, the reformer, and Jesus, the Messiah. The booths or tabernacles or tents would be temporary shelters of branches, such as were erected for the Feast of Tabernacles. So as I begin to bring this to a close, but how selfish Peter was thinking when he said it is good for us. What was to be done for the rest of the 12 disciples who were not there, who didn't have the privilege of this glorious celestial sight? What were to be done for the rest of the world? A bright cloud overshadowed them. This is the cloud of God's glory known as the Shekinah glory from the Old Testament. From this cloud of glory, God the Father spoke. You see, when God draws near to man, it is absolutely necessary that his glory should be veiled. No man can see his face and live. Hence, the cloud in this instance and in other cases, according to Charles Spurgeon. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The father from heaven rebuked Peter's attempt to put Jesus on an equal footing with Moses and Elijah. And while he was still speaking, it was important to interrupt Peter so that all would know that Jesus is unique and is the beloved son. He deserves our special attention, cannot be mixed with the rest. The occasion was most august. When the father speaks, the disciples are overwhelmed. All they can do is fall on their faces. They are in the presence of holiness and majesty. And it is a terrifying situation just like it was for Adam and Eve in the garden. They have a profound sense of guilt and shame in his presence. Just like you and I, when we see holiness before us, if you go through scripture, well, there's an angel, people normally fall on their face trembling until you normally hear the angel say, fear not, or the Lord say, fear not, because we are amazed and captivated by what we are beholding. No more foolish words or suggestions from Peter. Just sheer silence as the father silenced him. Silence and terror 
But this is where God's holiness has to put us on our faces in fear. Then we have no choice but to listen because our eyes can't look and our mouths have nothing to say. So we go back to the words of the Father. Listen to Jesus. This is the center and focus of everything we hear in the Bible. It has to point us directly to Jesus and what Jesus has to say. Before Jesus says anything, Jesus approached the disciples, uh, uh, the three disciples, apostles rather, and he touched them. Now, isn't that just a neat and beautiful thing to do? Do not overlook this very simple gesture, a very simple touch. People miss that in our society today. Whether it's teachers reaffirming their students, encouraging them that it's okay with a tap on their shoulder or hands around them, political correctness made people keep their distance more and more in today's world. People miss that touch in society today. Many reach out for help on the internet, but it's not the same as talking with a real person. Talking to someone in person, having them hug you or hold you or hold your hand. We are made physical creatures. We need to be touched from time to time. It isn't anything perverted. Jesus doesn't do anything but gently touched these apostles who were on their face in sheer terror. He doesn't strike them. He doesn't whack them on the head. He gently touches them, saying to them with his hand, it's okay. I want to just add something. You see, we hear all manner of teaching different parts of the world that have helped so many souls, held so many souls in captivity. The Lord himself admonishes us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. Not on our knees, not rolling on the floor, not scraping. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Because when you have an identity, when you realize who you truly are in God, you are the image carrier of God. When you realize you and I have been made kings and queens, kings don't roll on the floor. Queens don't scrape and kneel on the floor scraping. We kneel in worship, we bow in worship, but we don't roll on the floor, scraping because we feel unworthy. God says, come boldly to the throne of grace. And here's the other thing. He said, the first thing you receive when you come to his throne is mercy. Church, mercy. Mercy is the first thing anybody will receive when they come behind, before his throne. You see, and you'll find grace. Another word for grace is power. You'll find grace and power to help you in your time of need. We are told that his throne is founded on righteousness and justice. That truth goes before him. Listen. Know your place in God. Know how God sees you. You are worthy. He's made you so. He is not angry with you and I anymore. His wrath has been satisfied sufficiently by Jesus Christ. Come boldly and ask for anything 
from your Father in heaven. And he will give it to you. That's what he promises. That he will give you the grace in your hour of need. So finally, we all need mountain top experiences. To help us cope with everyday challenges of life in the valleys. Have you had a mountain top experience? If so, try to revisit that experience now and again and draw out the blessings that it offers. When things seem insurmountable to you, trust in God's faithfulness. Remind yourself of the occasions where God showed up for you in a mighty way. King David couldn't have had the guts to go against Goliath. But remember what he said. What did he say? The God who helped me to kill the lion. Who helped me to kill the bear. That same God will help me take out this uncircumcised Philistine. What has God done for you in the quiet? in the privacy of your own experiences that you need to draw out every time you confront something that seems insurmountable. Remind yourself of God's goodness. Remind yourself of how he rescued you, where he's brought you from, and that will give you the faith to step out again and go for it. Two years ago, I was in a terrible place. My life is full of pain. Despondency, it is no surprise God is using me the way he's doing today, right? He has to first try me. He has to first break me before he sends me out. That's how God does things, to know whether I belong to him. Because anyone that belongs to him, he will train and will chastise, okay? And I remember coming out here once, Dane, and you came out here, and Steve came out here with the previous vicar. I said, my business is going through a tough time. And you guys prayed for me. Okay, I'm not sure you remember. Remember? I said, I need, you guys pray. I don't come out of prayer every five seconds, but I need it. Prayer, I was heavy. It is like night from day, from 2007 to today. This God is fearsome. Trust him. Finally, church, don't just be regular. He has so much he wants to show you. He's not going to show you if you don't press him. Ephesians 3.20 says he's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above. Paul ran out of words. He didn't know how to tell you the mighty things God can do for you. So he used exceeding. He said, no, that's not enough. Abundantly. Still doesn't capture it. Above what you can dream, think, or desire. But what? According to his power that works in you. My question to you, how big is that power within you? Thank you, church.